So if we are talking about digitalized futures, there are a lot of open questions. What are these uh, qualifications? What are these skills which are needed in different um, yeah, in different environments? What uh, can we do with education? What are open questions? What which, what, what is the direction we, we want to go? And uh, in this workshop, we focus on two things. So first, an interdisciplinary perspective on informatics and its connection to society and the labor market in general. So it's quite a broad topic. And um, we also focus on computational studies within social sciences, economics, humanities, and in particular with focus on education, labor market, qualifications, trainings, adult education. So practically everything. And um, we also welcomed critical reflections on that on these issues. So. Um, I'm happy to announce that we have a lot of different uh, contributions from a very different background and I'm really looking forward to the discussion which we will have in this workshop. Coming to the agenda, so uh, we will have two uh, presentations before the coffee break. So the first one from Michael Thiemann, then one from uh, Matthias Meister. and. Um, after the coffee break, we will have two uh, next presentations. One of them is online. And then, sadly, one of the participants uh, is sick. So we will have just a fifth uh, presentation. And maybe we can switch, because I have, uh, I've put a lot of buffer time in that. Maybe we can finish before the lunch. But let's see. So that's it. That's the agenda. And now... Michael, the stage is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you very much and um, welcome again. Ah, okay, so you're already, uh, it's open already. That one. And thank you. Uh, just going to. Yeah, that works. Um, start again. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the uh, introduction. Um, so my name is uh, Michael Thiemann. I'm working uh, for the Federal Institute for Vocational Education and Training. And my part of the interdisciplinary bit is that I'm uh, a sociologist as a background. Um, hence, my question would be <clears throat> where the analysis of mass data um, will lead uh, sociological research. That's quite a broad question, and I'm actually breaking it down to uh, more or less two questions in a very practical uh, perspective. Um, that's why it's a practical approach. So um, I'm going to tell you a few words about why I'm looking into this and um, what struck me there in dealing with this kind of data. And um, then I'm going to tell you a bit about quality criteria that we've developed in the social sciences over the last decades and um, a few more problems that I see in dealing with um, this new kind or new type of data that we are currently um, starting to analyze more broadly. Um, speaking of which, throughout the talk and throughout the slides, um, it's often um, saying something like uh, social media slash big slash mass data. Um, I could as well have said it's a kind of textual data. Um, that's all a variable for this new kind of data, in, in our view, new kind of data, um, which has some uh, very distinct um, criteria from what we are actually used uh, uh, in dealing with. So, uh, starting with motivation, in the last few years we've seen uh, quite an increase in analysis of social media data. Twitter data, for example, is being used uh, to, to uh, 
reach uh, early warning tools for health threats. Um, it's also used for real-time political analysis and all kinds of um, different things. We are using Twitter data in our analysis as well. Uh, Stefan Udelhofen is going to tell you something about that in the last presentation. There are a lot of pipelines being built and it's become relatively easy to um, scrape and, and get these data and then um, conduct analysis on them. There's also something called critical data studies uh, that's also uh, emerged uh, within the last, I'd say, 10 years. And they call attention to how data are produced and also um, they call for critical interpretation and analysis. But what I didn't find there was a more um, distinct look at the data itself. So my focus will be to uh, search for criteria to, to assess and to ensure the usefulness and the applicability, actually, of uh, this kind of data for social science analysis. And um, I'm also going to focus more on tweets' contents rather than on metadata and paradata, um, which could also uh, be uh, analyzed, but that's actually a different pair of shoes. So... Um, as for a bit of more background, I'm going to tell you something about quality criteria for classic social science data. Um, we do have basically three quality criteria, and they are objectivity, um, reliability, and validity. Uh, we've introduced them since we want to, that's uh, quite a nice uh, quote here, provide data that can be used to make reliable and intersubjectively comprehensible statements about reality. The keywords here are statements about reality and it's also got to be intersubjectively, intersubjectively comprehensible. So what we want is measurements and then data that are the same between different persons, that's the objectivity bit, that are reliable in the sense that um, when an instrument is used multiple times, the results will stay the same, and also valid in the sense that we actually measure what we want to measure. Um, and this can become quite tricky with this kind of textual data that we are now uh, encountering. Also, when we um, survey uh, data, we uh, try to reach representativeness. And for this, we um, use uh, several methods. Um, we uh, try to get uh, as large as possible samples. We try to uh, stratify these samples or do random sampling uh, so that in the end, the sample resembles the structures that we want to survey and want to analyze. Um, this all boils down to survey data, social science data being specifically designed and made um, <clears throat> to fulfill these criteria in order to uh, reach our goals. And now there are these other types of data and they are not made uh, like Yoshida uh, wrote, but they are rather found. Um, so they are kind of processed data that also uh, is there and we can um, use it uh, if possible. Um, so if we if we look at these quality criteria, objectivity, reliability, validity, we see in social science data that this was designed for social science research. It's um, also often representative, so um, <clears throat> we've got no problems with these criteria here. If we think about this textual data, or these textual uh, kinds of data, then we are pretty soon at a loss. We are not aware of, or at least not fully aware of, what it was designed for. Um, uh, Twitter data, Facebook data, they allow for giving information, but we are not actually sure what the use behind that, uh, what the um, idea behind that is. We can assume that mostly it's commercial use or for commercial use, so that... Um, <clears throat> firms can um, um, send you uh, advertisements and that these advertisements are being um, sent to, to the right uh, people. Um, but we can't even be too sure about that. It, it might not be the only um, 
idea that it's been designed for commercial use. So this leads us to a problem of structure that I'm going to tell you something more about later. As for objectivity, um, the question would be that whether a user would reply the same way every time he's prompted uh, for an input in a specific way. And that might be the case, but it might as well not be. Um, if you, if you uh, 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 want to uh, use a new tool or want to enter a new, um, a new um, a community, you might decide to change your username, you might decide to change, I don't know, the place where you lived or leave out a bit of what uh, of your educational background whatever so um, the objectivity is not really known and it's possibly problematic um, as for reliability yes if we are talking about for example twitter data that we've scraped or facebook data then yes we are talking about secondary use so every time someone works with the same data that we've scraped, then it's going to be reliable in the sense that it's just the same data that we are uh, secondarily using. So different researchers should get the same uh, results there as well. But that's not uh, necessarily the case. Um, APIs change and terms of use change and also um, we might think of different problems that we um, apply these data to. So um, it might be that the reliability is undetermined for some users of the data. As for validity, um, we can't be sure about that as well. Part of the problem is that we are not quite sure what the data was designed for, what the surveying in, uh, parenthesis was designed for, um, but um, we also can't assess whether what people put in as data there is actually valid in the sense that we would um, want it to be. And then as for representativeness, uh, that's a clear no, <laughs> because um, we uh, uh, can be sure that online data definitely is skewed in one way or another. So that might be rather problematic. And looking a bit uh, more detailed at these uh, problems, I'd like to start with the problem of structure. Um, for, for this kind of textual data, we've got uh, a big problem in what Reichert called the front-end versus back-end um, uh, uh, design or structure, where we can only give pre-structured input, but we've got no knowledge about why the back-end superimposes this structure. So um, something like Facebook, where you can enter personal information, could have looked a lot different if in the back end people had decided that other information would have been interesting or necessary. Um, and we've got no choice about that. So we have a pre-structured um, input and that's being uh, pre-structured by the back end and the back end itself is being um, driven by a design that we don't know the aims of. So that leads to problems with quality criteria. We don't know what it's designed for, the objectivity is skewed, the validity is uh, questionable, and there's also a substantial problem. Um, there are researchers that see this kind of textual data as um, giving us information about digital traces of human behavior through the social media platforms. But I would argue that it's rather some kind of predefined, enclosed, and even quasi-experimental behavior, the problem being that we don't know the experiment and also not the rules. So actually, the interpretation and the reconstruction um, of this kind of data is severely hindered um, by simply this front-end versus back-end problem. Then um, the front-end back-end problem also leads to uh, a problem about structure and authenticity because these uh, technological affordances, uh, the question about what kind of information you can put in, is often not reflected as problematic. Um, 
it's even been argued that uh, it gives you a kind of um, 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 possibility uh, and endows you uh, with substantial control over your self-representation, which in a way it does make sense um, because you can very much choose what kind of information you are going to give but that's just within the boundaries of the information you are able to give <clears throat> so there's there's a problem surrounding um, these uh, input uh, masks and yes Obviously, there's asynchronicity, editability, the reallocation of cognitive resources. So you can put a lot of um, effort into how you uh, present yourself. But then that's going to uh, challenge the authenticity of what we see um, in online data. Because uh, it is a question how authentic you will present yourself when you have on the one hand, very much control over what information you give, and on the other hand, no control over what kind of information um, you are allowed to give. So the problem of authenticity um, is quite interesting, actually, because even if we don't have objective and um, reliable data, authenticity would toggle the validity bit, and we could then take these data as representations of structures or of types. So from a sociological point of view, um, authenticity would allow us uh, to, to use this data to really focus on these types that we are very much interested in as social scientists. scientists. Um, then the question would be authenticity, how is that measured and um, can we find uh, it in this kind of data? And the problem there is that this doesn't seem to be um, answered. This question doesn't seem to be answered. I found research, very recent research, uh, saying that social media is highly authentic, meaning that what you put in into one of these um, masks is very much in uh, concordance with something you'd uh, say in different contexts. On the other hand, there's also uh, research saying that this is so selective that it's going to be inauthentic compared to face-to-face -face, uh, 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 interaction. So, as a kind of um, conclusion, we could say social uh, authenticity is a social construct. And, and that's true in the sense that, yes, we also all do change what we present ourselves as, so authenticity actually depends on um, the audience. Um, but with social media data, uh, especially with uh, Twitter data, that leads to two, um, um, to two ways of dealing with this. One would be avoiding uh, some topics, so there's self-censorship, and the other would be to, um, to balance your information, uh, which means you'd lard it with personal information to kind of um, not make it sound as bad as you'd uh, think or make it sound a bit more like that's really uh, authentic uh, to you. So the question would be, where would this take us? Um, to sum up, social media or this kind of textual data our data where the quality and the usefulness is not, it's, it's not possible to assess that with the established criteria. These data are pre-structured in, to us, an undisclosed way, and that's hindering interpretation and analysis. And it may or may not be authentic, but that's depending on the context. But the context, thinking about the uh, front and back end uh, problem again, is something we'd have to assume. So it's partially defined as something pre-structured, but also in an undisclosed way. Actually, we would have to ask ourselves if we wouldn't need to refrain from this kind of analysis, or maybe we'd have to restrain our analysis to the reconstruction of highly specific designed representations. But that's not actually something sociologists would do. That's possibly something psychologists could look into, but uh, even they would have problems with the pre-structuredness of this uh, data. And that leads me to my two final questions, actually. Um, 
as a sociologist, uh, if we follow Weber, mm, we would need to, to understand something in order to be able to explain its meaning. So if people act, we'd like to be able to explain why and what they meant by this, and therefore we have to understand this. And if this kind of textual data, social media, big data, would help us understand and find explanations to reconstruct meaning, that would be a very, very uh, interesting uh, thing. But the problem is that we are not yet there, I'd say. And my question would be what we needed to get there. And, and the two most pressing problems, I think, would be the problem of structure and of, uh, of authenticity. And then related to that, maybe I'm just looking in the wrong direction. I mean, the quality criteria that I've been talking about um, have been applied to, to specifically designed types of data, um, to social science data. But maybe these kind of, uh, kinds of uh, criteria are not the ones we can assess the usefulness and the applicability of textual data with. So possibly there are different quality criteria and I'd like to ask if you would have any idea about what different criteria there were. So that's the second question, which could these be? Um, yeah, thank you very much and I'm happy for your questions and comments. Maybe just one hint for those participating online, you can raise your hand and I will monitor that. So if there are questions. Um, yeah. Maybe I have a question. Um, what I didn't really get is how does your approach uh, include the classical quantitative data analysis, which is also well known in the social sciences, because I could imagine that we could just solve that by saying, okay, this is quantitative, qualitative data, so classical approaches. Um. Uh, yes, <laughs> I've been thinking about that as well. The, um, the thing with qualitative data, um, uh, which is often interview data, um, uh, is that it's also specifically designed. You even often uh, do a kind of, of sampling, like, a, I don't know if that's the correct uh, translation, like maximum contrast, for example. Um, you want to find some. Uh, you want to find out something about a, a type of behavior or a type of action, and then you uh, think of what kinds of people would be um, able to tell you something about that. And then you uh, go to these people, and um, the first interview would be with someone who fits perfectly, and then the second interview would be with someone who doesn't fit at all but you talk to him about the same questions and then you'd compare these two uh, sets of answers. And the thing is that there you know something about the sample and you know what you've designed it for. And that's something that's still missing with uh, this kind of textual data. So um, even though we think of qualitative data in the social sciences as being less representative because we don't have um, uh, a, a, a simple weighting that we could multiply the answers with, um, they are in fact very much designed still and it's still possible to um, to conclude something about types of behavior. And, and there's a bit that's just missing with this kind of textual data um, that I'd like to, to get my, my hands on. So that's actually part of uh, this question, what we would need to, to get there in order to make more sense of the, out of that data. So hi. Um, so I have to say I'm not at all in your field and I'm just here to learn something new and I came late. Uh, so, but I, I'm curious on maybe um, a related point, like um, now with the new technology, um, especially on kind of the abilities of large language models, 
we had um, in a session yesterday, we had a discussion on um, how that can actually bridge maybe the the gap between like quantitative methods and qualitative methods, like kind of using that to not say, okay, we either do that or that, but we actually bring these closer together. And I would just be curious to hear your opinion or thoughts on that. If you have some of this, a related question, so. <laughs> Yes, it, it is a related question, um, but it's rather a question that's, um, that's taking up at a later step in the process. Um, <clears throat> if I were to use large language models to assess this kind of textual data, then I'd find some kind of... Oh, let's call it substantial structures like uh, mm, mm, um, 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 uh, Zusammenfassung, uh, summaries, <laughs> thank you, um, uh, of what's in this data. And also I could go and, um, and do some um, automated coding uh, within that data. But that's actually already types of um, or ways of analyzing the data. Um, what I still don't know is if that data is actually useful for me and if it's applicable to uh, to use these kinds of uh, methods uh, on them. It's, it's quite possible to do so and it actually also would make life as a social scientist a bit easier if I could just run a large language model over millions of data points. But um, the problem would still be that I don't know if it's actually really applicable so it's it's uh, answering a question that's coming later in the process yeah the question about um, these problems of structure and authenticity um, as Twitter and social media is so big and influencing the opinion of so many people how do you analyze these data without considering that these like these messages these told stories and whatever it is already creates a reality that then actually works that actually is the real reality although these data might be pre-structured and use the the it it might be undisclosed like the circumstances might be undisclosed but the reality is there so doesn't it need to be another another form of reflection there of okay what's what's the original data and what is the outcome which could be a new reality that, that's a tricky one um I'm not going to pretend that I'm going to give a definite answer on that, uh, uh, but it's it's actually a very interesting kind of puzzle. Um, the assumption would be that this new reality that would be created with this kind of data would actually be the reality. That's a problem for constructivists and um, for, for, for modernist um, uh, theories and they can handle with these kind of meta structures rather well. Uh, so it might even be possible to, to arrive at a point where you could say, okay, this is in all actuality somehow some kind of reality let it be a first or second order or whatever um, that would be quite interesting and we'd have to be pretty confident uh, to say that that actually applies for enough people and enough people that we want to learn something about uh, so that these types actually can be seen as being embedded in some kind of um, some kind of reality. Like I said, it does make sense, and and, and you can argue in, in that direction. It just doesn't uh, convince me wholly 
because I, I still think that the problem would be that one, you don't um, include everyone there. So it's not a question about social reality, but of parts of social reality. And two, the problem would still be that these undisclosed ways in, in which data were pre-structured in the first place are still not solved and, and still not uh, eluded. So, um, yeah, it, it might be... It might be completely interesting to take these new realities and then try to reconstruct uh, the structures that formed them but that's going to be something very difficult <laughs> yeah but interesting okay thank you very much for oh, your yeah. interesting presentation and um, oh, the discussion. And now we will continue with another practical perspective, a different perspective, but uh, nonetheless a quite interesting perspective. And um, yeah, Matthias. Yeah, my name is Matthias Meister. Um, I am totally new to these kind of conferences and uh, type of thinking, actually, as I am a theologian. I studied theology at the University of Tübingen quite a while ago, and now I'm teaching in the field of theology, Protestant theology. And um, I'm doing a PhD in... Uh, the interdisciplinary field of um, ethics about digitalization, what it does uh, with our society, what it changes in our society. Um, so, and my paper is on ethical challenges of digitalization in education, reflections from a theological perspective. So these are just reflections. I don't have any data. Um, it's my personal experience and my reflections on them, of course, informed by my PhD uh, program, my PhD thesis. So, let's start. My classroom experience drastically changed the last years. Um, nowadays, when I get into the classroom and I don't think I tell anybody anything new there. The It looks like this, like the picture, right? The laptop is open by on, on the table for every student. The smartphones are on the table as well. And although they are talking to each other, they constantly check their phones. Some scroll Instagram, some are on the news, some chat with others that aren't physically there on WhatsApp and other messengers. Um, so the room is flooded with stimuli before the lecture actually starts. The informations are there and it's more information that the students actually can process. So as I uh, teach theology, I normally study with a prayer session, so we pray together. And normally the students close the laptops, put away their smartphones and focus on the prayer. But it happens more and more that I have to remember the students to take their gaze away from their screens. And this is an ongoing change in society that technology is everywhere it's everywhere um yeah and this influences our behavior and it influences our perception of reality and i just want to take a critical stance so to say a critical reflection on these changes 
I have a very broad definition of digitalization that um, you might say is completely nonsense. I don't know. I take simply take the word digitalization and say digitalization is putting the reality into digits, making it countable, available for scientific reasons. This is the digitalization process that I use in my uh, PhD thesis. So this, this process is an ongoing process that started way before computers and smartphones in, were influencing our everyday lives. It started by industrialization, by putting together technology and mathematics, engineering sciences and so on. So, um, and, and we know that this drastically, drastically changed our societies in industrializations. The medieval society or the society coming from the Renaissance didn't work with industrialization. It had to be changed, like the introduction of the clock drastically changed uh, social structures. Um, and, and this was necessary for the big production lines to function. So um, this is an ongoing process and it's not only bad or anything. I'm happy that I live nowadays and not 200 years ago, right? I'm happy to use technology. Um, but the, um, the issue here is that these changes are subtle and that they are slow. Um, I think they are accelerating, but they, they change our behavior and our societies in a way that is not critically reflected by everybody. There are science, sciences about this, like sociology and so on, but people in society don't reflect on the change of behavior as much. And this is can be problematic. I give just one brief example. Um, my field is theology, as I already mentioned, and um, we discuss non-technological things, right? Metaphysical, physical things. We talk about God. We talk about ethics. We talk about moral uh, philosophy. We talk about very non-technological issues and I experience it more and more that my students come to me and they ask technological questions about these non-technological areas. For example, they ask how does this work? How does this function? Which is a totally different category than what we're talking about. Right? They ask, what is the outcome for me? Why should I do that? How does this work in my everyday life? And um, although these questions are not illegitimate, they come at the very end of the thought process, right? And not at the beginning. Um, and this is one way to see that the technological perspective on non-technological areas of human life increases. And um, this has wait, to do, of course, with the influence of um, technology on society. As the world becomes made more available and um, means become more productive and efficient, of course, we engage and we emphasize on these better and productive, more efficient means. One issue or, the, or one tendency that we human beings then have, that we overemphasize the means and um, the ends. What do we do these things for? become less and less important. Okay, let me give you a broadly accepted, well, at least in my fields uh, of study, broadly accepted example. Industrialization process in the last century um, was a uh, very technological process and it was a very 
expensive process. process. We had to have huge amounts of capital in order to build all these production lines and it all it had to change society there had to be a whole supply chain management system that had to be to be installed within our society within economics so it was a very heavy process and it was very expensive and in order to this this was done to produce products right so but in order to finance these heavy and very expensive processes this progress um, these developments we started or in this the the economics started to change the products from lasting products to consumption products so that these products don't last half a century or even longer but that they break down and people have to buy new stuff new products every five to ten years or even every year so um, the ends having a good product became the means of building consumptive products in order to sustain the heavily cost, highly cost, well, it costed a lot, right? Uh, a development process. So means were overemphasized over ends. And uh, in the end, we nowadays know that this process might, in the end, cost our planet, which is a very high price to pay. And we're struggling with that nowadays. So um, this is just one example um, when means are overemphasized over ends. And um, another example that I want to give is the thought of human freedom. Now, human freedom, what is that, right? It's a very broad term and they are, is defined very differently. Um, but what I want to talk about is the experience that the the freedom that technology gives us. So when I get up in the morning and I want to brush my teeth, I only have to open the tap and I get fresh water, right? I'm freed by technology to go to a well, pick up the water, carry it home and brush my teeth. So this gives me a certain amount of freedom. Um, and you can you can play this game on and on right so when i sit on the couch and i want to look watch a movie it's just a click away on netflix or amazon prime or any other um technological product right so this gives me the sense that my freedom is a status i have only to do very little things in order to get what i want right is a status um, and if these technologies don't work usually well if it, they really don't work if you don't have to restart the router or anything like that if they really don't work the problem is way bigger than an individuum can do about it right you need a whole structure of experts and um, technicians and so on um, whereas in former days and in philosophy as well freedom is defined as a mandate it's something we have to act out it's it's a duty a task that we have to do so when my students come to me and we talk about freedom within theology um, like the truth makes you free is a verse in the bible and so on then they say to me I don't experience this freedom. I do believe in Jesus Christ. I do believe what the Bible tells me, but I don't experience that freedom. What's wrong with me? Right? So I start to tell them that it's not a status. It's nothing that you feel right now. That this talk about freedom in the Bible is a duty, is a task to act that you're freed in order to serve to act out your freedom 
something you feel. So this is a different mindset that's going on because of our everyday life experience that we are free and we only have to do very minor things to experience this freedom. And um, what, it, what technology gives us is negative freedom. Um, it's an, uh, a, an understanding of liberty uh, defined by Isaiah Berlin. It's quite old, but um, he talks about negative freedom and positive freedom. So negative freedom is not negative the way we would talk about negative things like hate or disease or anything. Negative freedom means that you are free from. Like technology gives me the freedom to be free from very heavy bodily tasks, right? It supports me. It frees me to do other stuff. So it's very much negative freedom. Um, and um, the problem is that by overemphasizing the means over the ends, we overemphasize the negative freedom. We ask, how can we do that in order to get rid of this task, in order to get rid of hunger, in order to get rid of, to be free in a way of negative freedom. But what we need as well is positive freedom, to be free for what? What are the ends? What are the goals? Right? So the discussion, the in our society about positive freedom have, has become very, very difficult. Yeah, and I think um, because there are no, no common worldviews, there is a plurality, right? So it's very difficult to talk about positive freedom. And, um, but only because it's difficult, it doesn't mean that we don't, don't have to do it. So um, I just want to look into um, three problems of the dominance of technology it's the dominance of technology within society um, not the that I, I criticize technology per se um, and uh, that that relates to these overemphasis of means and the lack of positive freedom right first of all, of all there's a mixing of categories um, going on. Right. So um, what do I mean by that? Mixing of categories is by technological means, we are able to um, to realize things that are actually fantasies. It's within the fantastical realm. Um, so by technology, we experience a sort of disembodiment. Um, we have virtual realities, right? Virtual realities, when you play a video game, you're in a virtual reality and you're able to be whatever you want, right? So it's a fantasy. You can be a flying lion or anything, right? So, um, and this type of disembodiment is totally normal. It's a human thing, right? When you listen to a to a, a very exciting story, you forget about your body and you're in, within the story, right? It's, it's normal. People had it over centuries, right? Or if you're in love um, and you're talking to your loved one, you forget about the reality around you. You're disembodied. Um, however, what the technological system makes available is that we are more and more capable of putting these fantasies, these disembodied experiences into a reality that it can be objectively experienced by others as well. Of course, we don't have the medical means to do everything we want. We don't have the technological means to do everything we want, but the tendency is there, right? So the, the thing is that when the fantasies are taken as reality, you, don't, you lose the common ground of society. You don't know what the other considers to be true anymore. And this is fine as long as society doesn't have a problem. This is fine as long as our technology works. But what happens 
when we experience a severe crisis, then these categories of fantasy they aren't helpful, right? We need to get along with our human restrictions in order to cope with existential crisis. Um, the other thing is responsibility. The responsibility within our technological system, everything is intertwined. We saw this during the corona pandemic. Now, I don't want to go into the political discussion, but um, there, there, were, there was a problem that the politicians didn't know how to cope with pan the pandemic, right? So they asked the scientists. The scientists had computer models, right? So they could, they could put the data into computer models and say, this might be a helpful thing to do, this might be unhelpful. However, these are just models, right? It's not reality. What they couldn't put into the model was, for example, what would happen to pupils, students, when they're not allowed to go to school, right? So this is a price we nowadays have to pay because we, could, uh, we couldn't model this kind, of, um, this kind of outcome. And who is to be claim, claimed for that? Who is responsible for that? The scientists, the politicians, the, 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 the doctors? We don't know. So, the, the, the system is so complicated, so intertwined, that not, not one individual or one group of people can be made responsible for the deeds. It would be very unfair, right? And um, then there's the missing common ground. I've already talked about it. And I think this missing common ground, it derives from the technology because this pulls into future. So nowadays we experience that the newer the technology, the better. This wasn't always the case. When a farmer 500 years ago um, had a father that was a very good farmer, it was the best thing to do to ask his father, how did you do that? How did you, did you, when did you plant the seeds? How did you treat the animals and so on? Right, okay, I'll come to a close. Um, so, but nowadays, the elderly, the wisdom of the elderly is, is heavily questioned because our experience is that the newer technology is the better, right? And moral, moral, moral standards, commonly accepted moral standards, the newer they are, the, the, the worse they function, because a moral theory is one thing, but to test the moral the theory, it takes years, it takes, it takes decades to prove that this moral theory actually works for our society. So to invent new moral standards is, is fine, but you have to take it to the test. And if a moral standard works, we only can tell after decades of use. So the wisdom of the elderly is, is heavily criticized and, um, and we think it's not valuable because of our experience of technology. But actually, I think we would be, it would be very good to listen to, to elderly people about their moral thoughts on society, right? So these were just some highlights, some thoughts, some, well, it was provocative and there was lots of generalization going on. I'm very aware of that, but I thought it would be good to, to make you rethink some perceptions of technology and society in our days. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation and uh, a lot of open questions and a lot of open ends uh, to, to think about. Um, are there any questions? I have some, but um, also to, to those who are uh, online, please raise your hand so that I can manage that you get the word. Okay. 
maybe otherwise I can start. Um, you, you mentioned that you have a very broad definition of digitalization and um, I mean, there are a lot of ethical discussion about, for example, artificial intelligence uh, nowadays. And uh, do you have an idea about how the broader definition of digitalization might um, help to or maybe influence the, these ethical discussions uh, about AI in general? That's a very difficult question. Thank you very much. Um, like, it's when you when we think about AI, the way I understand them, and this is I'm on the very well. I'm I'm just using perplexity AI or ChatGPT and wonder what it's going on, right? Um, but the way I see it is it, that it's just a step further of making available the knowledge um, that is to be found in the internet. So for me, it's a good tool to uh, research, for example, to summarize books or find new journal papers um, for my research, and, and that's it. Um, so it's just... I think it's just another step of making available with statistics and mathematics, making available our knowledge that's already there and knowledge that hadn't been made available before because these were, were was a knowledge like novels, text-based, um, creativity, things like that, that we couldn't um, put into objective standards. It was an art. And now technology helps us to find mathematical formula to simulate creativity or to simulate like novel writing and things like that. But I'm very critical about if that actually is the real process and that is real creativity if we just simulate creativity by mathematical mathematical means so um, I think it's just the making availability the next step further uh, of making the world available for scientific research and uh, technological progress Yeah, maybe in the meantime, um, I can have another question. Um, because uh, let us come back to, to skills for a digitalized future. So um, what do you think? Uh, it's actually two parts. Um, first of all, what do you think what uh, skills would be necessary for pupils leaving school and joining uh, the education system? And the second one is, are there particular skills for a digitalized future which you, which you think would be necessary for theologians? So for, for pupils leaving school, starting in the academic world, I think it's, it's um, very, very important, no matter what they study, that they start to th get the, the tools to take a critical perspective on what is actually going on. So um, when I talk to um, students on a bachelor's level that study um, media design or software design and so on, it's a very, very technological approach. And of course, they have to learn these skills, right? Um, but the, the, to, to reflect on the meta level what they're actually doing uh, is is highly necessary um, uh, even for like the the one that's only a developer in in a software design or anything um, we need to think in different categories about not only the usability of software but actually how what how does 
the the end user have to think in order to use this type of software um, and what does this then mean for his approach to to knowledge to um, to his field of expertise how would that how might this change his field of expertise actually and um, is that what we want as a society is that really what we want is it really like open ai chat gpt right is it really that we want people naively asking a large language model about whom they should date or what to believe in uh, in different religions and things like that um is that really what we want people to do to outsource their critical thinking to a machine which they don't understand and which just echoes our our common knowledge in found in the internet um, these are questions that need to be asked before we put the technology out right and it's not done or it's not done by the people that do the technological processes right um, and this is only to be achieved by interdisciplinary um, discourse so um, we should start again within universities and University of Applied Sciences to work, have more interdisciplinary um, seminaries and so on so why don't they philosophical students and the informatics students have a course in ethics together why isn't that possible should be necessary i think or sociologists and economists and well you get the idea and the other thing for theologians um i think it's very necessary for theologians to to start to think and to talk about this mixing of categories because um, the, the mixing of categories in the end, uh, rationality is cultural um, and um, only because an, so to say, rational, scientifically thinking human being thinks theology is not worth it. It's a lot of nonsense doesn't mean that it actually is it just means that within his or her plausibility structures what is plausible uh, and rational consider rational that that the that is what they think about theology it doesn't mean that it objectively is rational nonsense right and we have to find a new language to translate the elderly knowledge that is within theology into our our time. So I have a bit of a provocative uh, question mm -hmm. because you said we had uh, to listen to the uh, more elderly knowledge, and yeah, I. I somehow have a bit of a problem with that because um, I think that there is a general problem that um, the elderly people which uh, carry the elderly knowledge um, somehow um, yeah, don't really listen to like the moral standards of the newer generations and if it wouldn't be more necessary to just both of them listen to each other and then uh, combining both of the moral thoughts what your thoughts are on that. Do you have a quick answer? Because we are already overdue for the coffee break. So, <laughs> because I think there is a lot of things which, we, which could be discussed here. And uh... yes, there's a lot to discuss here. Right. Um, short question. It's just the elderly don't have to solve the problems of the future, right? So if they don't listen to the younger generation, so what, right? Um, but if the younger generation doesn't listen to the elderly and take a critical stance, they don't have to accept everything, right? Some moral principles from, principles from, from the past don't, don't work in our days. The, the society cha already changed, right? So um, some things won't work. So we have to, to, there needs to be a critical reflection 
of this and some things must be translated into our time of course right but uh, to say first of all the elderly have to listen to us it it won't solve any problem because the the elderly they they don't have to deal with the problems of the future they already have lived their life right so um yeah of course this would be nice but um Elderly people tend to be stubborn. And I, by elderly wisdom, I don't mean, mean only the elderly people. I also mean the, the old concepts within religion, within um, former days that historians work with, right? So there's a lot of knowledge that is very valuable for our days that is just neglected, right? So that's a short answer, I hope. Thank you very much. And uh, we will now have a coffee break. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, yeah, different perspectives on some interesting questions. And uh, as I said there, I guess a lot of open questions regarding ethics, regarding all the other stuff. And um, I can tell you he will be there. So maybe you can grab him in the coffee break and continue the discussion. Otherwise, we will meet again in half an hour, not 25 minutes, I guess. So it's uh, at half past. And uh, for all those who have a presentation in the next slot, please uh, um, talk to me because we need to get your presentation on that computer. OK, thank you again very much. And uh, see you in a couple of minutes. Okay, then welcome to the next session, and uh, without further ado, we will just continue. The stage is yours. So now we will come to a bit more technical topic. Um, my name is Gianluca. I'm from the University of Hamburg. And I'm going to present uh, you to you our paper, Enhancing Educational Insights, a real-time data analytics stack for project-based learning. Okay, so um, yeah, we all kind of know that uh, digital project-based learning formats, especially in higher education, are not only on the rise since uh, COVID-19. So um, students, when they are in such um, remote learning environments, they often use digital tools, um, which can be used uh, where the data, uh, which is generated by those uh, digital tools, can be used um, with data analytics. So this enables uh, tutors and uh, teaching staff to um, make data-driven decisions in order to supervise those students better. So therefore, in our paper, we propose a generic data analytics stack, which can be used to analyze such project-based courses with the data which is generated by the digital uh, tools used in the, those courses. So therefore, in this paper, we implemented and evaluated uh, the, uh, the stack in a project-based software engineering course. So uh, our research question for this paper was, how can an adaptable real-time data analytics stack be constructed based on the student usage data? So at first, I want to tell, I tell you a bit about the related work, which is um, in our, in our paper. So um, at first we learned from Saiz Manawis et al. that the application, application of data mining can be used to enhance uh, education. And in Asha et al. we learned that, as I already told, COVID forced the entire higher education into remote learning. We all know it when we couldn't uh, go to the university. And in Van der Spool, they uh, said that it's especially hard to monitor students in such learning environments. And we can't really see what their behavior is, what they are doing. And Celik et al. proposed that it is possible to use dashboards as learning analytics tools in order to provide the information to the lecturers 
what, are, what is the student behavior, what are the students doing. And uh, Shimada et al. proposed different um, frequencies of learning analytics feedback. So at first it's the annual feedback, so year-to-year uh, -year feedback, uh, which is mainly used to improve courses and yeah, the students will uh, benefit from it later, so it's not while the course is running, but after it and then the next course will, uh, will benefit from that. So the next frequency is the weekly frequency where yeah, mainly after the courses, the uh, lecturers look into the data and they can improve the courses on the go so that is better in the next week. And the last frequency is the real-time feedback where it's even possible to analyze the data generated by the students doing the lecture and exercises so that the lecturer can react to like deviations or anomalies in the data presented by, for example, a dashboard. And in Papatsumitsu and Economides, we learned that there are um, six different categories of uh, learning analytics contributions. And I want to go further into those categories. So the first category is about student behavior modeling. It is mainly about identifying different uh, learning strategies and when they occur. So in this paper, they found seven use cases for this um, category. So the next category is about the prediction of performance. It's mainly about identifying and evaluating different uh, factors which um, can be used to the prediction of the performance of students. And they found four use cases for that. The next category is about increased self-reflection and self-awareness. It's about enhancing the lecturer's awareness, identifying underperforming students in the courses, and having a visualization in order to inform and guide the students, but also to be used by the lecturers in order to get better insights in their courses. The next category is about prediction of dropout and retention. It is quite straightforward. It's only about um, the risk of students dropping out in courses or, or retention, which has six use cases in this paper. Um, the next category is, a pro is about improved assessment and feedback services. It is mainly about how to provide the feedback forms uh, and the types of the feedback. And they found four use cases for that. And the last category is about uh, the recommendation of resources, which is a quite technical um, technical category, it's mainly about um, the description of technical infrastructure and procedures like um, data mining algorithms or the suggestion of infrastructure for learning analytics tools. So now I want to position our work in the scientific context. So uh, I presented the categories of uh, Papatsumiru and Economides to you, and our paper is located in the increased self-reflection and self-awareness. So as I told, one of the goals is to enhance the lecturer's awareness so they can be get better insights into their courses, identify underperforming students so they know um, which student groups or students they uh, should help better, and also um, appropriate um, visualizations in order for the lecturers to really find um, those students better. And another goal, as we learned from Shimada uh, et al., is that's quite uh, helpful to use, real-time feedback, especially in virtual learning environments, so that you can, doing exercises, really identify students and um, get a grasp of what is happening in the course at the moment. And this enables timely uh, teaching enhancements, so it's quite on the go. And you have the latest information at any time. So at the moment where you are looking in, for example, a dashboard, you will have the latest information about what is uh, going on in the course. So next, I want to talk a bit about how this course we conducted this experiment, um, the implementation in, was structured. So the course was happening in a uh, hybrid setting. It was a project-based software engineering course and hybrid because the first six weeks of the course were completely in presence in the university. After that, the two months, we were in a complete remote learning environment. So we couldn't really look at the students, what they are doing. It was only in um, remote sessions over uh, a video call tool. So um, there were different stakeholders in this uh, course setup. So uh, we had lecturers 
um, one lecturer were in it who conducted the whole course. Then there was teaching staff, which mainly consisted out of student teachers and 22 students who were engaged into uh, the course. And um, yeah, they used JIRA for project management. That means that all of the tasks uh, which were, uh, which had to be done in the, um, in the software engineering course were created in JIRA and distributed to the student groups and um, yeah, to the individual students in order to give them the tasks they have to do, but also things like agile sprint planning were conducted in JIRA. So in order to have an exchange with the students, there were weekly plenary sessions where all of the stakeholders were in, and uh, they were mainly used for coordination and uh, feedback where they talked about um, activities which will happen in the next week and um, yeah, important dates. So in the course, there was an existing data analytics solution, by, but it uh, required extensive knowledge for operating it, so the lecturers and the teaching staff couldn't really use uh, the existing solution. So uh, as a methodology, we um, focus on a more inductive uh, approach. So we constructed uh, and implemented the tool in the course, and then we abstracted from it in order to generate a more general and uh, transferable solution, which could be used by other project-based courses or other courses in general. So for that, we adopted a prototyping approach, which was also mentioned by Wilde and Hess. Prototyping because um, it's mainly about uh, implementation and evaluation of an MVP. So the stack itself was developed and uh, evaluated in two iterations. So we had two main uh, evaluation rounds, but also continuous feedback from all of the stakeholders doing the development of the stack and uh, utilizing of the stack and the observation in general. So now I want to talk a bit about how we approached the construction of the data analytics stack. So at first, we looked at the existing data analytics solution, found uh, problems and requirements out of the solution. So therefore, we created a high-level data analytics concept where we really um, put together the, the structure and the uh, abstract components and how to structure something like that. Then we researched for appropriate technologies, um, yeah, which uh, we could use in order to construct this data analytics stack. And uh, therefore, we created an in-depth data analytics stack. So this was designed in an extract transform load structure, mainly because we had extensive knowledge on this structure and also the um, old solution was based on it. So then we combined the tools we found, the technologies, um, and yeah, focused on a more uh, scalable approach so you could really um, plug in any components you want and uh, extensibility, so you could extend the stack from uh, various components you could think of, and ease of use because we wanted everyone to uh, be able to use the stack with not as much uh, technical knowledge, so that even the lecturer was able to operate the, the uh, solution. And then, in order to have a point for evaluation, we designed a business intelligence dashboard where you could see the data generated by the students in order to have a functional and correctness uh, evaluation of the data analytics stack. So here you can see the actual data analytics stack, which we built. Um, yeah, it mainly starts with uh, having webhooks from Jira, so we wanted to build an event-driven solution that um, if something happens in Jira, like an, a task is created or something of the data changes the student, uh, changes the status of a, a, ticket, uh, of the, a task, um, yeah, we would directly be uh, informed, so the data will directly uh, be forwarded. So um, then we used uh, a Flask web server and a Kafka message queue, which were mainly just used for forwarding the information which we got from Jira into a, a transformation component, into an ETL application. This ETL application um, is Apache Hop, which we mainly use because it's quite easy to use as it's only required uh, like uh, low code solutions. And yes, it's. Uh, it uh, is used for the transforming the whole data into a beneficial uh, shape in order to analyze it, but also to design the data warehouse. This was based on a, a Postgres um, database and yeah, houses the data model on its own. And um, the, whole, um, the whole stack uh, before the business intelligence 
will be uh, or is operated in real time. So when uh, an event comes in Jira, all of it uh, just uh, went through uh, without having to have manual refreshes or do something. So it will just um, go directly into the database, the latest data. And then we used uh, MetaBase for visualization, especially because it's quite easy to use. It has a query builder in it, so you don't even have to know like SQL or have an extensive knowledge to get the data. And um, yeah, the stack refreshes every 60 seconds, 60 seconds because it's uh, limited by MetaBase, which, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, this whole stack is uh, quite generic. Uh, maintainable and user-friendly, as I tell, told. And the code is um, provided in GitHub as an uh, open source, so you can just go in the link, or the link is also in my paper, in our paper. So for the demonstration and evaluation, as I told, we had two demonstration rounds, main demonstration rounds, with the lecturers teaching staff and the students, but also uh, continuous feedback, which we use to further improve the stack and uh, design it in a better way. So um, we found out that the stack um, proved to allow the timely uh, reactions to student behavior anomalies. For example, we found out that one of the student groups wasn't even, uh, even using Jira. So for generalizing the stack, we uh, created an abstract uh, concept of it, uh, of, the, of the structure. So we said that there are multiple so uh, sources possible because it's quite uh, a generic structure. You can use like every uh, tool which, which creates data. And then uh, are, there are numerous uh, ATL applications possible. For example, uh, Pentaho Spoon, Talent, or Apache Nifi, which you can use for um, yeah, transforming the data and loading it into a data warehouse. And um, yeah, the, the business intelligence tool could be used for directly real-time analytics, but also for historic analytics as the data is available in the data warehouse. And uh, on purpose, we didn't include the web server and the message queue because they are more like uh, optional components. You could uh, replace them by any other technology. For example, Apache Nifi could be used to uh, replace them completely, but it's a quite, um, yeah, quite complex uh, solution to operate. So now to the discussion. Um, we found out that the DA stack fosters the achievement of the course's objective, um, for example, enhancing the, the student guidance with uh, directly um, enabling to react to the anomalies. So as we found out, the stack enabled timely and historical analysis. So we could directly, if something happens in, in Jira, we could directly react to it and have the latest data at any time. So um, then, uh, we created the conceptual, um, more abstracted data analytics stack, which could be used as a guidance, but we also provided the open source code that you could all um, just use the code and uh, deploy it on your own. And we also found out that uh, such a holistic solution can foster a broader application, uh, especially also in uh, non-technical environments. Um, yeah. And also, it is possible to trace uh, the undesirable student behavior back to, for example, um, yeah, the materials or the, the teaching explanation in general. So if you um, realize that a lot of students have uh, problems in the same uh, application, you can um, yeah, think about uh, that you had to do something wrong as a lecturer. So for limitations, um, we conducted a single case study, so more evaluation of the data analytics stack would be necessary uh, also in other project-based courses or courses in general. Then uh, the proposed uh, components are not proved to be the best solution, but uh, we found out that they are represent uh, representative as the stack was working quite fine for our uh, case. Then we conducted an unstructured literature res uh, research in the, in the paper and um, yeah, it, it could uh, maybe limit um, the, the knowledge which, which we had from other cases. And also, um, yeah, you kind of need a certain technical um, knowledge for deploying the stack, but also uh, data literacy um, in order to um, interpret the, the data from the visuals in the business intelligence part. And also, we didn't quite... Um, uh, have uh, evaluated the benefits of conducting this whole learning analytics in real time um, uh, over the effects of doing it in, on a weekly basis. So for the conclusion, um, as, as I showed, the data analytics stack uh, concept was developed and implemented. 
um, yeah, we achieved a better supervision of the students as we found out more about uh, their behavior and the student groups uh, in, those, uh, in this project-based course. And also the data, um, uh, the, the stack allowed analyzing the data uh, for, for benchmarking, uh, comparing student groups to another, or have uh, knowledge about the course in general, and supported, as I uh, showed, the detection of behavior anom anomalies from the student and student groups in general. So for future research, it would be quite nice to expand to more sources uh, like GitHub or Confluence in order to get more usage data. So this uh, where sources used in the project-based course, which could also be implemented in such a stack. Then also it is possible to integrate process mining, which can be used for identifying bottlenecks in like uh, Jira workflows. Yeah, And also um, it would be quite nice to develop a more holistic system, which uh, for example, completely relies on a no-code solution from getting the sources into creating a dashboard uh, or go a step further on having uh, a de um, a automatic information on when course deviations or anomalies happens. Thank you for listening and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. And uh, once again, the hint to all those attending online, please raise your hand if you have questions. Uh, but... Hi, Jan Kremer. Um, I have a question. The, 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 that is, you concentrate mostly on the ability to create dashboards to uh, see what students are doing so or did you uh, did i just miss which is always possible um any specific metrics that are to help uh the lecturer to uh, guide him from whatever and how do you if you're doing it uh, I, I would imagine that is more a proxy variable than actually what you want to measure so i think there's no easy way to completely say um this person is lacking off and how do, do you see uh, or how do you plan to avoid the trap that is easy to f uh, to fall into to just have some equivalent of um, code lines written um, per week or day or a session as a not really good proxy for the activity of a student and their learning progress So actually, the main focus of our paper was on constructing this uh, real-time data analytics stack. So the whole um, data interpretation from a dashboard is not really part of the paper itself. It is more about having a point of evaluation in order to know if uh, our stack is really functional working, if it can be used for conducting analysis. But the main um, topic of anal anal analyzing such causes was well, not really a part of our paper, but it's also an interesting topic and yeah, a future research for the stack. So my question uh, went in the same direction. So just to be sure that, I mean, you, you did work together with a lecturer and, and teaching staff. So did you get specific feedback from them or did you in the first place uh, sit down together with them and, and talk about maybe pedagogical aims or whatever, or what kind of information they wanted? And did you then implement that or did you just go ahead and say, okay, this is what we can do and see what you can do with that? So as I also was involved in operating the old solution, I kind of knew um, which um, questions we should answer with that. And um, yeah, it was mainly that uh, we constructed a set of um, questions in, those, uh, in this uh, business intelligence dashboard and then therefore um, which data we need in order to provide those questions. Um, but also in those uh, two demonstrations, uh, bigger demonstrations we did, we talked about also about uh, which uh, of the visuals are really helping in order to get a better grasp of the, the course in general and uh, which are not really necessary to, to use. Um, 
I don't know if my question is actually valuable or in within your field of research, but the way I understood your presentation was that you monitor the behavior of the students. Um, so how did you reflect on the change of the behavior of the students when they know that they are monitored versus they are unmonitored? And how do you think on from the lecturer's perspective that it doesn't happen that the lecturer grades a student differently when he she knows that the student did follow the lectures and this doesn't become biased so um yeah it's um for this for this experiment or for the study we conducted it was in a project-based course so it wasn't a traditional lecture and um, yeah, it was like that the grade was really uh, also depending on the activity of the students, not like uh, we have metrics and you have to, to do exactly that for getting this grade, but uh, like active part participation and usage of the tools. So if you wouldn't use the tools, obviously um, you wouldn't get um, the, the best grade, but it's um, also an um, interesting uh, discussion about the, the ethical perspective of it. So. Um, we decided against um, having individual students in uh, in the uh, monitoring in general. So we um, yeah focused on student groups so that there this problem wouldn't quite happen. Um, yeah. So I, I, I forgot the first uh, thing of your question. What the was change it? of behavior. Ah yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's actually quite funny because uh, the students, although they know they are monitored in a way. Um, there is no measurable impact we, we um, yeah, thought. So the students don't really um, do more of it uh, from the uh, behavior we expect. But it's, um, yeah, as, we, as we identified, so the students knew they were monitored, but uh, still some of them weren't using, using GWA, although it's uh, part of the grade. Then, thank you very much again for your presentation and for your answers. And uh, then we will continue with the next presentation, which is online. Um. So we're back again. Um, yeah, those essential workers in, in German, the German term system relevante Berufe, um, had some privileges uh, such as childcare. Um, for the children and were also the first to get a vaccination. But however, they also had restrictions, they couldn't work at home, they had a higher risk of um, a higher health risk. They had, uh, of course, no holidays and also longer working hours actually um, from, uh, from uh, political ordered uh, longer working hours. So um, here's one example, please uh, keep that in mind. We're coming back to, the, to this tweet later now that everyone is shitting themselves over COVID-19, nursing is suddenly systematically relevant. There you have this, this, uh, this connection with, um, in the context of the COVID-19 crisis, the, the aspect of nursing and also a systematically relevant um, aspect of it. Um, outline what I'm going to do. Um, I also mentioned this cooperation with uh, Michael and Lisa Funi, and the basic or the, the epistemic outline of it is how we value and evaluate, or how is the evalu evaluation of jobs and occupations in, in modern society, in, in our society. So, um, which job is important, which job is not. Here we have to, the case of a crisis, and crises are always good to. Um, <laughs> to evaluate and look at specific uh, situations. So when our routines fall apart, we, we uh, get insights into how our world, modern world, uh, our world works. Same argument with, with Matthias uh, in, the, in the morning with um, now we have a crisis, now we have to look what are we actually doing. So, and in the context of um, Corona crisis, there was this, this aspect that we had at some point, this, this uh, category called system uh, essential workers or system relevant berufe, and they gained some insights into um, uh, from social sciences. I will. Um, that's my first part. So, what are essential occupations? Why we should care? And the second part, um, 
building on of that is what can t actually Twitter tell us about the perception and valuation of essential occupations. Um, therefore, we have um, three steps. I'm, I'm going a little bit through the data collection and preparation, an overview of our results, and also um, on the sentiment analysis we did. So, uh, what are essential occupations and why should we care? Um, Systemrelevance, uh, German word essential uh, jobs in, in the US and the American um, world, uh, first mentioned actually in the context of, of the financial crisis in 2009, but there with, uh, with the context of banks that are too big or financial institutions that are too big to fail, so they had to be saved by the government. Uh, in the context of um, the, the corona uh, crisis, this, this focus changed to... Um, to um, Certain areas of uh, our in, uh, certain areas, and also especially to, to occupations that are uh, contribute to ensuring the supply of the population with important, partly vital goods and services. This is the official definition from the Federal Office of Civil Protection: is disaster assistance. So, um, Bundesamt für um, Sicherheitsschutz und Katastrophenhilfe, irgend so. Uh, yeah, uh, there is also the same definition from, from the um, uh, Federal Agency for Information uh, Security. Um, so, as I already mentioned, they had special rights, but also some restrictions. Um, all the jobs who fell under this uh, definition. However, uh, we are dealing with a political category here. So, this means it's not a, uh, it's not a real category in this sense. There's uh, it's it's a setting from political from the government. So, um, the, in the German case, we're living in a federal state. So uh, uh, we have a, a difference between the federal level, the Bund, where they define the category, and we have um, the Länder, um, the federal states, where they applied the the category. So every um, federal state, jedes Bundesland, had a had different lists of system relevant jobs or essential. Uh, jobs. So what we're dealing with is on the one hand a geographical dynamic. So Brandenburg, for example, had um, agriculture jobs in agriculture as a, uh, um, categorized them as essential. Berlin not. Can we can see maybe why? Yeah, uh, Berlin's not that famous for the agriculture, but they need food as well. So you see there are some distinctions. And also we had. Um, a temporal dynamic, so to say, with longer, um, well, Corona uh, needed a few years to, to leave, and now it's probably coming back, never see, but yeah, the, the, the crisis took a while, so they came more, they added more and more jobs to this list, so we have this temporal dynamic, for example, at some point you need teachers to open up schools, or you need, or some jobs have been forgotten in the first part, like people who feed or care for animals. They were not on, on the um, first list. Um, why, why is it important to look at uh, essential occupations? A closer look at this is, um, there have been various studies in social sciences um, looking at what, what, what are the um, elements of um, essential jobs. And one aspect is what is shared by many papers is uh, essential jobs are um, this is from a study from uh, Schrenker, um, Samtleben and Schrenker. Um, most of the uh, essential jobs are underpaid in comparison to all other jobs. And second, the professional prestige of these uh, occupations is also below average, average especially in cleaning, uh, logistics, food retailing. There are, of course, some exceptions, as you can see on the on the chart. For example, in in um, medical doctors or dentists are highly recognized in society, have a high um, beruf prestige, uh, occupation prestige, or um, you can also see we're at a, a informatic two thousand twenty three. So, IT administration, IT network technique are also highly. Um, uh, have a high uh, occupational prestige. So, another aspect or the, the main factor to explain this difference in that essential uh, occupations that are basically fundamental for the functioning of our society are underpaid and under, um, under, uh, have a lower professional prestige. 
who is that um, they have in general a lower level of skills and qualifications um, they have um, more problematic working uh, environments they have normally atypical um, occupations like they're they're working part-time they have no fixed term contracts and so on and but the main reason is they have um, a lower qualification level in general. So the, the classical theory to explain this is the human capital theory, so that we we were we have higher qualifications and will earn um, more money for our um, for the for the work we put into our education to uh, a level up, so to say. So, um, but essential occupations are in large part um, are. Um, grouped in large largely are these unskilled occupations and also occupations for which one is usually qualified with a vocational education and training so you can see where we're coming from as the Bundesinstitut for Berufsausbildung so um, vocational education training is also uh, relevant for for system uh, for essential jobs therefore um, vocational education training um, contributes to a considerable amount of, of, um, of essential jobs. We put this together in our own study we did, um, came out at, um, in January, I think. So we, we compared two lists of jobs. The one list was the, the narrow list, the first Berlin list, which is 20, 20 occupations. The, we compared this with a wider list of uh, 61 occupations, basically all the jobs who um, added to the category of systematic uh, essential jobs during the pandemic. So, uh, as you can see here, uh, these are the qualification levels of um, the jobs based on this. And you can see on the, on the left side, these are the, the, the narrow list with a much higher percentage of um, uh, vocational education and training and, and lesser academic um, qualification. You can also see that w w with the ongoing pandemic, these changed so that at the end, the, the wider list with the 61 um, essential occupations are basically on the same level than, than our jobs in general. So they're um, more or less a cross section of all occupations. Mm. Um, while doing this, we, we also uh, looked at what actually can uh, uh, closer look at the essential occupations tell us about um, maybe the post-pandemic age. And one aspect is actually that we have to find the problematization of the evaluation of professions. So how do we ev evaluate jobs or, or professions on an individualistic, humanist, human capitalist uh, uh, level or in their way of social utility. Another aspect was that uh, research about um, essential occupations draw interest uh, or more attention to class relations and class theories. And also uh, with this, and maybe an ideological redefinition of what should count as achievement, so to say. So not just uh, building your own individual um, education, but also what are you doing with your job. Mm. So, um, by looking at this, what can actually Twitter tell us about this problem and about the perception and valuation of um, essential occupations? Um, the background for this was data, uh, as Michael mentioned in the morning, data collection and social sciences to get representative data needs time. And, and um, uh, we tried, maybe Twitter is an alternative, or X is an alternative to um, get a um, more real-time look into how these categorized already show some effects. So, um, uh, our basically more to explorative questions have been, does the tweet talk about one or more essential occupations and can we tweet, uh, can the tweet be interpreted as positive or negative in the overall context? So, um, so just a short overview about preparation and data. We used the, to uh, the tool TM4VETR and uh, Twitter's API to, to scrap data from 2007 to 2023. Um, we, we collect all the tweets mentioned in essential occupations based on our based on the lists. I showed you so 61 um, occupations in general. We, we 
uh, looked at official job listings and also synonyms that we coded the tweets in relation to the systematic position of the German classification of op uh, occupations, uh, the classification der deutschen Berufe, um, uh, a huge, so basically the, the, the database from the from the employment agency where every job has a specific number to be identified with the qualification level and so on. So standard um, uh, database. So, and then we contextualized tweets with, uh, with the two lists uh, of uh, and as I showed, we, the result was we removed some doubles and we had 1.2 million tweets about essential occupations in this uh, time frame. As you can see, our data shows an increase in tweets to essential occupations over time from just 17 in 2007 up to uh, more than 240,000 in 2023. Um, the black line you see is the number of all tweets uh, so the, the wider understanding of essential occupations and the, the, the green dots, I hope it's green, I'm, I'm colorblind. Um, so the green dots are the, the, um, the, the share of uh, essential uh, jobs from the, from the early, from the ad hoc list of the German uh, government. So these are the 20 jobs like nursing and so on that are um, there. What you uh, can actually see here is, is quite interesting. You can see there are more tweets about essential jobs, but the share stays basically the same. You can um, see some um, outlines, for example, when there was a lockdown, you see a, a jump in, in the average of essential occupations. That's uh, basically the moment when the, the, uh, we all know about this job category in, in media and so on. So, so now um, the, the tweet I showed you before was um, our uh, is pflege, uh, our nursing system relevant? That's that's the point. I have to come to an end. I, I realized so. I'm sorry for that. Um, you can all read this in this paper. Um, just to show you the the shares uh, actually um, skyrocketed after the more or less at the end of the pandemic, and we're not sure if this has something to do with energy crisis, new new government, and uh, or the Ukrainian war. We we need to look. Uh, more into that. Um, just a short look at, at what we also did. Is there a positive or negative interpretation of tweets? We actually found out most of it is neutral, 80%. Um, we have more uh, negative than uh, positive sentiments. When we look at uh, um, negative sentiments in job, we can also see uh, that they are skyrocketing at uh, the end of the pandemic, um, a little at the beginning, but take into account these uh, mean sentiments here. Um, what we also can see is, um, again, here, the, 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 it's non-essential, but this means the, the wider category of essential jobs. And essential jobs are uh, different from another, but mostly the, the essential jobs, so the nursing and healthcare, so the, the, um, the first essential are basically more negative interpreted than, than all of the other jobs. That uh, might be an interesting fi finding uh, uh, in the context of work conditions, how hard, they, how bad their employment is, uh, uh, payment is, their working hours. So we can uh, find many people who, who um, complain about their jobs, for example. So I'm, I'm working pretty hard, but but yeah, my, my payment is not good, and uh, I'm probably getting sick, and so on. So that um, might not be an actually an interesting uh, reflection and. Um, yeah, I will. I will skip this. Just we we compared also um, on the on the job level. We compared uh, sales occupations in retail and also financial and insurance services, which uh, was a job came later. Here you can also see at the peak at the beginning where these negative tweets for um, for um, selling uh, retailing people's. Uh, if you think about Angela Merkel's speech about Kassiererin uh, sind uh, systemrelevant, so retail people are system relevant, that's uh, exactly uh, there. Uh, expect, uh, yeah, uh, it's not it's not the peak. It's when it goes down because the, the negative sentiment uh, went down because it was a more positive view on uh, retail people in supermarkets. Um, yeah, I skipped that and uh, just want to come to the conclusion. Uh, back to this tweet. Um, actually, this tweet is not in our 
um, database because our pipeline or the, the, our algorithm didn't find it because Pflege was not um, um, specific enough to be categorized. But you can also see you know, this is obviously a, a relevant tweet in the context of uh, essential jobs. So uh, to conclude, maybe as we, we need to still, this is still work in progress, we need to adjust our tools and uh, coming back to to uh, uh, Michael's um, presentation in the morning, I think what we um, actually a, a good case study to think about different kind of data method, uh, data sources, different kind of methods, and to uh, use them more in a complementary way. Social media data as alone is not the answer. We, we need to combine and, and reflect they with each other. And I think a very useful concept in this sense is to look at Norman Denson's um, concept of triangulation, which is actually based in, in qualitative social sciences. So uh, not just uh, doing inter conducting interviews, but also observing people. And so I think we need a wider understanding of triangulation that is also including uh, social media or, or big data. Um, thank you very much. I'm looking, uh, I'm looking forward for the discussion. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, maybe we have time for one short question. <laughs> you can ask me afterwards as well. Yeah, I, I, I think you need to, uh, to leave, so. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very insightful. Uh, just one short question that came to my mind is, how do you make sure that you filter out trolls, uh, troll tweets, um, and actually monitor real people tweets? Well, of course, I, I cut it out aspects of data cleaning and uh, how to um, to uh, making sense of Twitter data here. Uh, we, I mentioned we cut out some doublings, uh, so and some aspects that could be analyzed as trolling, so to say. But it's uh, that's that's a critical aspect of how many of these 1.7 million. That sounds big, yeah. 1.7 million uh, tweets about. Uh, uh, essential occupations, but also many of these are retweets and other aspects is how much of it is actually um, trolls and just um, propaganda, so to say. It's uh, we don't I don't we don't have an, an answer for that yet, but we're still working on it. How to get better data, so to say. We have, in a way, that's what I mean. It's it's the interesting part to look at. Um, how we can combine this data to make them more re reliable, so to say. Yeah, uh, uh, just a short comment on that. Um, since we were interested in how these occupations were um, discussed, it would have been okay to have trolls yeah. in there because then we could have seen that some part of the discussion would have been started or, or led by, by these uh, tweets then. So that wouldn't have been a, too much of a problem there. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Also, also trolls are part of discussion, so yes, yeah, so, yeah. But that's the problem, we, we don't know much about who is discussing here, so there is more or less a, a lack on the Actors side are there actors or non-human actors, so to say. So that, yeah. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation, and he will be available afterwards. <laughs> and I'm I'm so sorry that we uh, that we're a little bit behind time because we had that these technical problems. So uh, I call Danush. Are, are you here? Yes, I'm here. And can you share your screen or uh, do? Mm. No, it's. Uh, I still don't have the. Okay, so the, the the technical guy uh, said something like he changed, and uh, now you should be. Uh, okay, so I will open the presentation. All right. Okay, so. Uh, you can see the presentation, can you? Yes, I can see that, and yeah, thank you for that. Um, 
And uh, now the, the issue is that we cannot see you, but uh, at least we can see your presentation and we can hear you. And yeah. you need to, to um, tell me when I need to click on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe if I, okay, I can turn my, can you see me now? That's all I can do. No, it's, it's, it's not working because ah. uh, it's, it's on different uh, windows. So. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah. then, all right. Uh, so apologies for the technical issues also on my part. Um, but um, so let's start. Uh, shall I? Yeah, please go ahead. Yep. Okay. So uh, hi, everyone. I'm Danush. Uh, together uh, with me, I and my teammate Ali, we prepared a paper that we're going to see. Uh, if you um, how do I go to the next uh, slide? Um, uh, can, I can't go to the next uh, slide. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so the paper that we are going to present you uh, briefly is related to monitoring of digitization and sustainability on Twitter. Uh, my teammate uh, had an interview job, so he couldn't attend, but I am here to present it. Our supervisor, Dr. Dorpinghaus, uh, kindly uh, walked us through the presentation um, and help, helps me to navigate through this. So I have to go to the next slide. Uh, yeah. Yep, thank you. So before everything, uh, let me just uh, briefly talk about uh, the system that we used. Uh, it's used based on Twitter, so I have to talk about Twitter naturally. So I know you know the details, but I try to briefly just uh, describe it and skip it fast. Uh, Basically, Twitter is a social media platform that also you know that was founded in 2006 for enabling users to uh, share short-term short posts called tweets with limited character counts, but can include additional information as metadata, which is very important for us. So if we click on the slide, uh, the next bullet point, uh, yes, shows that uh, uh, about the features of API. So besides of being an individual status sharing platform, Twitter offers an application programming interface or API that allows public data sharing. So this S API is flexible and a scalable solution that can provide access to various tweets data within a set of parameters. Uh, unfortunately, it has been changed, uh, but luckily we have uh, still access to the latest database uh, just before the changes up, uh, took place. So if we go to the next bullet point, um, yep, thank you. Uh, Twitter has a major influence on research and is commonly used by researchers. So it's very important for academic and academia. This is due to the platforms being more focused on text-based content than visual content and its mm, access to the API, which enables researchers to access public Twitter data based on their level of uh, access. Uh, you can access the Twitter based on even if, it, at least it was like that, that you could access the data based if it was free tier or researcher tier or industry tier, but it is changed, unfortunately, now, which I'm going to talk about it later. Now, if we go to the next bullet point, uh, okay, yes, uh, we want to show how this is focused on our uh, work. So this representation presentation focuses on utilizing Twitter as a medium for analyzing sentiments towards entries related to sustainability and digitization. Basically, we used it to see what Germans think about the two subjects, and we uh, at the end see how it is distributed or scattered around the whole Germany. Uh, and we used a spacey library along a custom type system to perform senti sentiment analysis on a specialized Python pipeline. So if we go to the next slide, um, yep, thank you. Uh, okay, so with the, uh, yes. Uh, okay, with the clarification of how important uh, the Twitter platform is for information extraction in the previous slide, uh, the very first step is to find how uh, we can find the most optimum and best solution to scrape data from Twitter. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so for this, we use Tweepy as Tweepy is an open source and easy to use option and can access Twitter API itself. While Tweepy eases the data extraction itself, configuring it needs additional effort, one of which is to which, the, which API version and authentication is used. So we used client.searchall tweets, uh, which is just changed recently and you no longer can use it. Now, if we go to the next bullet point, Yep, thank you. Uh, as you can see, that X part is the new logo, and not the something else. So, yeah. Since we're working on the non-real time data of Twitter, and we wanted to gather as much tweets as we can, so we had to create some workarounds and limitations, and we had to uh, store it somewhere. Uh, which we're going to talk about uh, briefly. Uh, if you go to the next bullet point, so we chose the how to store the data. We chose SQL Lite database, and the entries of the database consist of uh, 680,000 recent tweets, which covers most focused topics of sustainability and digitization. Moreover, the included information in the database is the tweet topic field, tweet ID, hashtags, and tweet text, as well as other relevant uh, metadata that we scraped and with, uh, with addition to the tweeted times and uh, author's ID and author's information, which unfortunately, uh, based on the new policies, you no longer can access, but fortunately, we have the data. So if we go to the next slide, yeah, thank you again. Uh, we use the structure of pipe, uh, Python's pipeline, which has three main components, reader, sentiment analyzer, and writer. Uh, if you click and uh, we see the next one, yes, exactly. The reader file, uh, which fetches the scrap data, and it stores the data in a database and makes it possible to analyze the data. The next one, uh, Yes, uh, we have sentiment analyzer for the analysis. Uh, as we talked, uh, we chose a spacey, very performant, easy to use, and fastest way. At least it was. Uh, it is, it still is, but uh, yeah, after it, we have to tweak it if you want to use it on the X platform. And then uh, finally, uh, if you go to the next pipeline, we have a writer which saves the results in the same database and it, you can easily access it. Um, and uh, lastly, if we see the last, yes, uh, type system, uh, we use a custom type system, which is um, developed based on DK Pro cases. So that's a standard and we added four elements, tweet text, ID, hashtags, and sentiments, so that if you have doing, if you are doing research work, you can easily uh, do it uh, using your own uh, software and it's loosely coupled so that uh, you can easily access the data uh, between the three components that we talked about. So uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, uh, we did all this to have some uh, information and to gather and collect uh, some insightful data. So our reports uh, consist of, of two parts, report one and report two. So uh, in, initially we just sorted uh, based on the, the reports. I want to talk about the first report, which is just a, a table of content of the tweets that were sorted by the frequency. So if you click and if we see the first table as an example, you can see that we just, uh, if you see the count, you see 500, that's the, uh, the technical limitation. We just wanted to see what are the most uh, frequently used terms. Uh, if you just uh, carefully see the table, we see, yeah, we have cloud computing, uh, the English word, and we have a hybrid bus, the third one, English word, big data. Uh, so that's not really give us really a meaningful data if you, but if you uh, dig deeply, you can see that the most frequent uh, words have um, a little bit of a negative uh, average sentiment in them. And we talk about it uh, later, if, but if you click and see the least frequent uh, words in the next table, if you just, yes, thank you, you see that uh, surprisingly, mostly they are German, 
which we actually expected to be because we searched for the German terms um, and uh, but uh, you see a few or none uh, English words or at least the ones that you can use in English for example e-bike or something like that uh, that's a, one of the observations that we had and you can see that uh, mm, the German words that even use less frequent have not too much negative average sentiment. So that's another observation that you can get from this report. So uh, if you click on this and if we see the bullet points, yep, thank you. We have three um, um, more observations. So many English words uh, were in the table. So we decided to uh, disregard those and also uh, this yielded some information that was much uh, focused and more focused on German and German uh, Germany or German tweets or tweets from uh, originated from Germany, which uh, resulted the second report. So if we click and go to the next slide, yes. Um, in addition to disregarding the English words, uh, we only uh, focused on the origins of uh, the tweets. So if you tweet, you can get the origins and locations of the tweet. So uh, we set it to Germany. And uh, this second report uh, just naturally gave us a more German-oriented German tweet. So uh, it means it's not English, so we can actually do a sentiment analysis in in german and it gave us some meaningful uh results uh, otherwise uh, we couldn't get some more meaningful uh, results uh, we had to do uh, additional iterative uh, english uh, sentiment analysis but that's uh, not really necessary for us and the most uh, famous uh, the next thing is that we get from the second report is that what are the most famous i mean positively talked and infamous negatively talked or ne ne has the terms that have uh, negative sentiments and what are those uh, terms and what are their subjects so we could you please conclude within the next five minutes oh um yeah i can do it faster so uh, if you just click on the yes here's the two reports and you can see that um uh, as i talked uh, you can see that uh, it's based on the uh, average uh, as, as sentiment and also the frequency so i have to do it faster so then we go to the next page so this one this one is a mix of the frequencies and also uh, the uh, sentiment so we've mixed those together multiplied those and gave it a, a score so it out it makes a more balanced result so if some word is very negative or some words were really rarely talked but has very negative sentiments or some words have always talked but the sentiments are zero it means it is natural these uh, get uh, balanced results. So this is the second one, which we believe is makes more meaningful results. So based on these reports and the next one, please, please uh, go to, um, go to the next slide. You can see that uh, yes, click on the uh, slide again. You can see the, uh, the, the 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 origin of the tweets. Uh, as you can see, uh, we can somehow conclude that uh, from the Western uh, thousand, there are more activities uh, like talking about people talking about sustainability and digitization but that's not all if uh, we have a interact an interactive map uh, basically the dots only show the origins not the frequencies maybe you can see north uh, east have more frequent uh, tweets about uh, specific topics so if we go to the next slide uh, we have some conclusions so the conclusions, um, uh, if you click on the slide, maybe, yes. Um, so we concluded that Twitter is very important for getting information. Uh, so next uh, next bullet point, please. Yeah, the levels, uh, the tweets from Germany show that positive sentiments towards sustainability initiatives, particularly in engineering, but uh, they have negative uh, ideas and negative expressions regarding the execution of this. The next one is the tweets primarily come from urban areas, highlighting potential urban and rural labor uh, market differences. 
Okay, and the next one, uh, yes, uh, Ger German uh, express positive, uh, that's the uh, extra information that we got, that they talk about green recreational sports um, positively uh, re uh, often. So the next page uh, is about call to action. I just wanted to uh, suggest that we as researchers has to somehow uh, suggest Elon Musk to bring back the researcher API to get the uh, latest data from Twitter. It makes easier. The new policies they made is just uh, made researchers life complicated. So that was my uh, call to action. And the next slide, if you click, uh, is uh, extra references and the next one is just a thank you page so that if you have a question I, I'm here to ask. Um, sorry if it took a little bit long and there has some technical issues. I had to check two files so uh, I'm here and glad to answer any questions or stuff that uh, you may want to ask. Um, yeah. Thank you very, very much for your presentation and especially uh, holding it because the, due to the technical uh, problems, uh, it was really hard. So thank you. We could hear you well and we could also see the slides. And uh, now the question is, are there any questions? I think we have time for one short question because lunch is calling. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I, I, I guess lunch is calling. You can see, you can see the audience, but uh, we are already some, some minutes overdue. So thank you again for your presentation. And um, I mean, uh, uh, if, if there are any questions afterwards, we can just, I guess, send you an email. So thank you very much again. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you all for attending and um, yeah, enjoy the lunch.